Rick Warren wrote that fear, fear is a self-imposed prison that will keep you from becoming what God intends for you to be. Uh, we turned on the Purdue game last night. Surprise, surprise. <clears throat> and uh, they were running through the opening ceremonies, sang the national anthem. And then after the singing of the national anthem, they panned really quickly to Fletcher Lawyer. And I saw the look on his face, and I didn't say anything, but Barbara did. She's like, he looks like he is scared to death. And I said, I thought the same thing, but I wasn't going to say it out loud. Uh, because he did. He looked like he was scared to death. But I think if you're standing in front of 74,000 people, that has the potential to do that for you. But I want you to think, I mean, that would be intimidating for me, but I want you to think about moments in your lives when you've experienced a situation that caused you to fear. And I want you to think for just a moment uh, about how that fear impacted the way that you reacted to that situation. I have a, a unique experience that I often look back on. I was home for the, for the summer from Purdue. I was working for a small landscape company, <clears throat> and we uh, had been working on a job in Indianapolis. And when we arrived back to Connersville that evening, uh, we were kind of putting things away, and the owner confronted me, and he said this. And I still remember it. I mean, this is how impactful it was. He said, I'm not sure the conversations you had with that homeowner were appropriate today. And I was kind of shocked, you know, and thought, hmm, okay. And so I asked, I said, do you mind telling me what conversation you're talking about? He said, yeah, well, Johnny told me that you were telling them while uh, we were working there that they were gonna, I was going to work for you one day and you were going to own this business. I said, oh, well, actually the only conversation I had with the homeowners revolved around how they cared for the plants that we were putting in the ground. I never had any kind of conversation like that. And so I left for the day, and I didn't think anything of it. Came back the next morning, and he was waiting on me, and he said, well, I'm surprised to see you here today. I said, why is that? He said, well, I was afraid you'd, I thought you'd be afraid to show back up for work. And I said, well, why would I be afraid? He said, well, I thought if you said those things that you would be afraid because I confronted you. I said, well, I'm not afraid because I didn't say those things, so I'm here to work like every day. And so later that day, as time went on, he came over to me and said, you know, I apologize. He said, I, I think I, I realize now, like, you're right. You're telling the truth. You wouldn't have come today if you would have said those things. I said, well, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm here for the job. That's what I signed up for. And so I look back at that and I think, that guy really understood fear. Because he understood that he could try to make me afraid to admit to something or make me afraid to not come back if I did say it. And so he was using fear to manipulate. And at that point, you know, I was young, 19, 20 year old kid, and he was a 50 some year old. And so I learned a lot about fear. Because the truth is, fear has a way of impacting the decisions that we make, it has a way of impacting the way that we understand the situations that we're in. And when we get to today's text, you know, we're in this series called Resurrection Reactions where we're looking at how people responded to seeing the risen Christ. We're getting to a point today in the book of John where the disciples experienced fear. Uh, we'll find out that John tells us they were locked away for fear. And so we all have decisions to make in life when we encounter fear. They had a decision to make in life. And I think what we see is that when we reconcile some of the situations in life with the presence of Christ, something very powerful happens. And so we're going to continue this series. We're going to pick up exactly where we left off last week. So we started in John chapter 20. We ended with the account of Mary at the tomb of Jesus. We're going to pick up at verse number 19. So John chapter 20, verse 19. We're going to look at a few verses together this morning. I'm going to remind you, um, if you have the version Bible app on your phone, I always put out, uh, it's called a version event, but it's essentially an outline of the sermon, and you'll find other things on there. You'll find uh, announcements that we're making. You also have a way to give online, and then there's a way to fill out a virtual guest card if you're new with us. I highly encourage the version Bible app. So let's read these verses together, and then... I'll kind of pick them apart. 
on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So I want to give you some context here to these verses, because I think there are a couple different things that are going on with the disciples in this situation. So this, John tells us this, this takes place on the evening of the resurrection. So this is Sunday night. Last week, we looked at Mary's account. That was Sunday morning. Now we're at Sunday night. And the main reason the disciples are hiding is because they're afraid. Now, the NIV I read says they're afraid of the Jewish leaders. But when you go back to other translations and specifically the Greek, um, it's not just Jewish leaders. The Greek says they're just afraid of the Jewish people, period. They're afraid of the Jews. Uh, I think there's no doubt that they're fearful of their lives because they have witnessed what the Jewish people just did to Jesus And they have been associated with Jesus. And so they're afraid that what they did to Jesus, they're going to do to them. Many commentators think that these disciples went back to the upper room where they participated in the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. And they're locked in there. There's probably a lot of emotions flowing. We know fear is one of those. But most likely, they're not just experiencing fear. They're probably experiencing some disappointment, probably some disillusionment with the whole situation because the person that they followed for the last three years and devoted their life to is gone. Because remember, at this point, they have not physically seen Jesus. They've heard, but they haven't seen. And so I would venture to say that their intentions for gathering together and locking themselves in is probably to plan an escape route. They are trying to figure out, how can we get out of this city alive? And on top of that, it's probably true that the disciples are dealing with their own issues of abandoning Jesus. They're probably thinking, man, in his greatest time of need, where were we? I mean, we know that Peter denied him. We know the others scattered and they distance himself. And so it's into this mess of a situation that Jesus shows up. And that's powerful in itself. Like it's in this mess that Jesus shows up. Now, how would you have greeted these disciples if you were Jesus? I don't think my response would have been, Peace be with you. If I'm not the most peaceful person at times, my family can attest to that. You know, there was at one point in the game last night, I was screaming and crushing a can because I was frustrated with Zach Eady. You know, and rather than me saying, hey, Zach, just have some peace, man, and play basketball, it was like, why are you doing that? You know, I probably would have walked into this situation and said, Where were you? I looked around and I didn't see you. Or maybe it could have been like, I told you, because he told them, you're gonna you're gonna scatter. I told you you would do that. But Jesus shows up and he wishes them peace, not once, but twice. And so what we get a glimpse of in this situation is we get a glimpse of the mercy of God in Jesus' interaction with those people who left him, who who abandoned him. Now, it gets even more interesting than this because when Jesus issues this peace, he shows, he offers them his hands and his side as proof of the peace that he is offering them. Now think about that. The wounds on his hands or wrists and his side are the result of the violence of man. 
But Jesus frames these wounds in a completely different way. He doesn't frame them as, look what these people did to me. He says, you want proof of the peace, here it is. And the reaction of these disciples matches the reaction of Mary last week. John describes it with the exact same word. Uh, He says, when uh, Mary last week, the, the quote was, I have seen the Lord. And this week, John wrote, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. It's the same word. It's that horao in Greek, and it has two ways this can be understood. Now, remember last week, I told you John writes this way. John writes so that when you read something, you can pull two, two different meanings out of it. And he's doing that here with this word. So he's using this word that has two ways it can be understood. And the first one is, literally, I have seen with my eyes... But the other way this word is often used is that I have perceived clearly who he is. And so in both situations, with Mary and with the disciples, John uses the same words. And it seems to me that John is saying in both of these encounters that they are see- they're not just seeing Jesus with their eyes, but they're clearly perceiving who he is for the first time. I mean, it's actually sinking in that, man, he really is the Son of God. And so it's not the physical presence that changes their fear to joy. It's the understanding that he really is who he says he is. That's the transforming power of Christ. It's not in the fact that they just see him. It's in the fact that they understand that this guy really is who he says he is. He can really do what he says he can do. And so we see last week Mary's sorrow was turned to joy This week, the disciples' fear is turned to joy in the presence of Jesus and the realization of his promises. So, again, it's upon the realization of who Jesus really is. You get this greeting again. They they saw, they were overjoyed when they saw him, and then Jesus again says, Peace be with you. But this time... That greeting is followed with a statement of purpose. And he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now, I want you to write this down because this is kind of like the, the, big, the big point, the bottom line, you know. If you leave here today and you don't remember anything else, this is what you need to remember. Before we understand our purpose from God, we have to experience peace with God. That is exactly what is happening in this text this morning. Before we understand our purpose from God... We have to experience peace with God. And I want to dive into that word peace just a little bit deeper. And I've done this before in the past, but I don't think it can be emphasized enough. When we read the New Testament, the majority of what you're going to read is in Greek. But it's more likely when Jesus spoke these words, he actually was speaking Aramaic, which is a cousin of Hebrew. And so you kind of want to look at both, both languages. You want to understand what the Greek word for peace is, what the Aramaic word for peace is. And the Greek word for peace is arene. And, and interestingly, arene, which is Greek, and shalom, which is both Hebrew and Aramaic, they communicate the same idea. And it's not just the absence of conflict. So peace, when we think of peace today, we are so tempted to think of peace as the absence of conflict. But these concepts in these old languages, ancient languages, it's not about the absence of conflict. Rather, it's about the presence of something better. It's not that conflict is gone, but it's about something better is present in the conflict. So peace, really, in this sense, is about wholeness and completeness. And Jesus brings this up twice, multiple times, And when I see Jesus saying one thing the same way multiple times, that tells me, like as I'm studying, hey, pay attention to this. This is is super important. And so the context that these people found themselves in was not absent of conflict by any means. And so the peace that Jesus is speaking about does not relate to the absence of the conflict in their life. It doesn't relate to 
the turmoil that they're experiencing with the people around them, it's pointing to a wholeness or a completeness that could be experienced in the midst of that. And I think that's so powerful. And so what Jesus does, he says, here, here's my hands, here's my side. And what he's doing is he's alluding to the fact that it's through his death, though terrible and violent, it's his death that makes that kind of peace, that wholeness, that completeness possible. Because it's only through the death of Jesus that mankind can experience peace with God. And if you want to experience peace in your life, it has to start with peace with God. And what we see as we come to this text, not just this one, but with Mary, and as we continue through these encounters, peace with God is dependent on how we perceive Jesus. Whether or not we see him clearly with our minds and understand who he truly is, that is how we understand peace with God. And so Jesus brings comfort to this group of people who are in a, in a state of turmoil. Another thing that's important to notice in this text is that Jesus does not condemn the disciples for their unbelief. The, the, um, the song selection for this morning was really good. The second song, as they were singing the second song, I was thinking, man, this really... It goes hand in hand with the sermon today. Jesus does not condemn them for their unbelief. He does not condemn them for abandoning, abandoning him in his time of need. But what he does is he reassures them of the peace that they have with God because of what he went through. It wasn't about what they did or didn't do. It was about what he did, what he went through. And there is a monumental paradigm shift in the way that these people understood and approached life because of this experience, because of this peace with God. Peace with God was a priority over the chaos that happens in life because of different situations. And Paul experienced this same kind of shift. When, when you read through, you know, Acts, you'll find that Paul is completely transformed because of how he perceives Jesus when he encounters him. It's not just the seeing, it's, it's the perception of. Like he realizes you really are the son of God and it radically transformed Paul's life. And just after this, you know, Speaking of justification, Paul has this encounter, he goes on this mission, he starts writing these letters, and he writes in Romans about justification, which is just a fancy way of saying saved, salvation, experiencing peace with God. This is what Paul writes in Romans 8, 31. He says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now think about that in the context of which this occurs there were a lot of people at this point in Paul's life that were not happy with Paul anymore because of the transformation that happened. And now Paul becomes somebody that was hunted, persecuted, rather than the one doing it. And in the midst of that turmoil, he says these things, but if God's for us, who can be against us? It's about peace. Well, if I experience peace with God, all of this doesn't matter. And so now fear in these people's lives has been replaced with joy and with purpose. So the disciples are sent with this purpose. This, this is a, you know, some people read this and they're like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Jesus says this, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And this is a really tricky sentence to translate into English from Greek. And it's really not translated very well in the New International Version. So I, I did some digging and I did some looking, and I'm not the best like Greek speaker and the best at parsing out those words, but kind of where I came to, and I saw this in another commentary, the best way to understand what Jesus is saying here is, would be like this. Those whose sins you forgive have already been forgiven. 
Those whose sins you do not forgive have not been forgiven. And so the purpose that Jesus is placing on these disciples after they understand peace is the, it's essentially to go proclaim the peace of God to others. So the Expo- Expositor's Bible Commentary puts it this way. God does not forgive man's sins because we decide to do so or withhold forgiveness because we don't grant it. We announce it, we do not create it. And this is the essence of salvation. All who proclaim the gospel are in effect forgiving or not forgiving sins, depending on whether or not the hearer accepts or rejects Jesus as the sin bearer. And so what Jesus is saying here is he's not saying that I have the power to forgive sins. You can't come to me and I I can't absolve you of your sins. I can't do that. Nobody can. What Jesus is saying, he's like, just go proclaim forgiveness of sins. If they accept it, they're accepting me. If they accept your message, they're accepting me. And it's about proclaiming peace. And we all find ourselves in the exact same predicament as these disciples. We have to, we have to wrestle with the question, how are we going to perceive Jesus? And the reality is fear can either keep us from God's presence or fear can drive us into God's presence. Now, these disciples were fortunate. Right? They were fortunate because they retreated and God still ran after them. Jesus still came to them. And so when we get, th- when we get into situations in our life where we, fear, we have fear, we are in a constant conflict, We're in turmoil. That can either drive us deeper into God's presence or it can drive us away from God's presence. And we all live with this same tension, right? We live with the tension of reconciling with God because at some point in our lives, we have rejected or disappointed him in the same way that these people did. We have all been there. And Jesus demonstrates that God offers peace even to those who have rejected him. The disciples, they rejected Jesus, and he comes and he offers peace. I wonder how many of us have fully avoided surrendering to Jesus because we are afraid of the condemnation that might come with it. Maybe we think about the past, like, there's this, this, this one thing, there is this one thing that I'm just so afraid to absolutely lay at Jesus' feet because of what might happen, because of what he might think, what he might say. And everybody is so familiar with John 3, 16. Quote it from, it's one of the very first memory verses I think I had when I was a kid. But you know what's interesting is that when I was reading John 3, 16 to try to commit that to memory, to memory as a kid, I read, I went to John 3, 17, and I committed that one to memory too, because nobody quotes John 3, 17 with John 3, 16. Everybody likes, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But John 3, 17 is just as powerful, because it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Notice that. There is no condemnation. God sent Jesus to save us. It's an offer of peace. Now listen, I fully believe that there are times in life when people see Jesus with their eyes very much the same way that these disciples did, very much the same way that Paul did. Post-crucifixion, post-resurrection, I think there are times when, when Jesus allows people to see him. I have read stories that come out of the mission field, especially missions to Muslim people, where Muslims that convert often communicate that they see Jesus. Whether it's in a dream or whatever, they see Jesus, and just seeing him is powerful enough for them to leave Islam and convert to Christianity. But I also think that those experiences are exceptional. They're not the rule. They're not the norm. But seeing Jesus, when we look at this text, does not mean that we have to see him physically with our eyes. Seeing Jesus is more about how we perceive him, 
how we understand who he is. And that he is present with us, and his presence is transformative. It's his presence that brings peace. So here it is again. Before we can understand our purpose from God, we have to experience peace with God. Why is that? Well, because our purpose is to proclaim that peace. And it is impossible to share something that you do not have. You cannot share something you do not have. And so if you want to share a message of hope and peace, you first have to experience it yourself. You know, there are a lot of changes that happen in life. But one thing that is guaranteed in this life, one thing that is certain in this life, is that every single one of us are subject to turmoil, chaos, and isolation. Suffering is a part of life. And the reality is we all make decisions that either lead to negative consequences and feelings, or maybe you're somebody that hasn't gotten the privilege of making a bad decision yet in your life. If that's you, see me privately after service and I need to pick your brain. Because I haven't figured that out yet. But if maybe you have, maybe you're like, you know what, I haven't really suffered that much in life. All right, well, the reality is there's a time coming when you're going to be collateral damage to somebody else's poor decision making. And you're going to suffer. You're going to experience pain. You're going to experience turmoil. And there have been times in our lives that those situations have made us lock ourselves away. We have locked ourselves away from everything else and everyone else because we are afraid of what might happen if we're really vulnerable in those situations. And the good news of the resurrection is, is that peace is possible in the midst of all of that. In the midst of those bad decisions, in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the pain, the turmoil, the chaos, you can experience completeness and wholeness, but it's only possible because of the presence of of Jesus Christ. So how do we find this peace? It's simple. To know peace is to know Jesus. Now, here's a few good places to start. To know peace is to know Jesus. Here's a second commercial for the YouVersion Bible app. Get that YouVersion Bible app. Because there are so many devotions that you can have right there on your phone that deal with God's peace. Subscribe to one of those plans. Make it a point every day to open that app. Finish one day of a plan about God's peace. Also, we have Right Now Media at Hannes Creek. We offer Right Now Media as a gift to each of you for being a part of Hannes Creek. If you walk through our doors... You have access to Right Now Media. All you have to do is let me know. I'll send you an email. You can set up your own account. And there's thousands of resources on there as well. And you can find video devotionals about the peace of God. Now, those are two simple things. Just once a day, pick it up, read a five-minute devotion. If you want to take it a step further, you say, "What? Well, you know what? I've done some plans about peace, but I really want to dig into this deeper. Read the entire Gospel of John. It's, it's really not that long of a book. You can read that in its entirety because when you read John, what you read about is the love of God, which is directly tied to the peace of God. And I just want you to know, I don't think I've said this enough. How do you, how do you continue growing in this knowledge of Jesus? That's part of our mission here. We want to know and grow in Jesus. I'm available almost every single Tuesday through Thursday with office hours from 9.30 to 2.30. All you have to do is make an appointment. Tuesday to Thursday, 9.30 to 2.30. If you say, you know what, I have more questions, show up on Sunday night for the sermon discussion group at 6 o'clock. The people that have been a part of that group, I think every single person in that group will tell you how powerful that group has been. Just because it's, it's a different setting and people get to talk and converse and just dig a little deeper. And if some of you are saying, okay, okay, you know, I've been, I've been following Jesus for a long time. I've experienced that kind of peace what do I do? What's my next step? Well, experiencing God's peace leads to God's purpose. 
You, that's not where, it, you, it's not like, oh, I get to enjoy all this peace to myself. No, you experience the peace. Now Jesus says, go share that peace. Share peace with somebody this week. Find somebody to tell your story to. Think about that. We read these stories and we talk about them week by week. But just think how God is writing your story. How, pe- how would people respond to hearing how God has transformed your life? It's just as powerful sometimes as reading about Mary at the tomb. It could be a neighbor, a coworker, maybe it's your kids, your grandkids. I guess the point is, if you've experienced peace, I think sometimes we make the mistake of trying to create peace. But Jesus has already done that. I think we just have to go out there and announce peace. We have it. We have it. We've experienced it. This is what it looks like. Before we can understand our purpose from God, we have to experience peace with God. I'm going to have the worship team come up. As they make their way up here, we're going to celebrate communion this morning. And uh, as we were preparing the communion this morning, Jeff Jeff stopped in. He's like, well, I didn't know you wanted to do this or I would have uh, started getting it ready for you. I said, well, I didn't know I was going to do it until really this morning. And here's the reason. You know, Thursday evening of Holy Week, several of you came out here for our um, communion service. And if you didn't, I would encourage you if we do that next year, come next year. It It was a powerful service. But one of the things that I learned personally as I prepared for that communion service and studied is that sometimes we put an emphasis on such a strong emphasis on the Lord's table about at- atonement, about Jesus paying for our sins that we kind of miss what Jesus is really offering in communion. Because in that, that last supper that he had, he kind of mimics things that are associated with a peace offering. It's not a guilt offering, it's not a sin offering, it's a peace offering that he mimics and the things that he says. And I think as I dive deep into communion, what this represents is it's it's peace. This is a time when we can share together a symbolic meal that represents the peace that we experience with God. We don't do this to earn God's peace. We do this because we experience his peace. And that's what this represents. It represents that we have access to God's peace now, even in the midst of our own failings. We still fall short, we still sin, but he still offers peace. But it also helps us to look forward to the day when, because of his peace, He will completely eradicate sin from our lives. And so as we take this together this morning, I really want you to focus on God's peace offering. It's not based on what you've done. It's not based on the decisions you make. It's not impacted by the negative decisions you make. It's all because of Christ's work on the cross. And he offers it freely. So really, this is only impactful if you've placed faith in Christ. If you've said, hey, I'm going to follow Jesus, communion's only powerful for you. Like if you say, I don't know about Jesus, still questioning that, I wouldn't take it. But if you're a person that says, you know what, I want to follow Jesus. I want to know more about that. There's no better way to make that commitment than by taking this together with us. So we practice open communion here at Hannes Creek. Uh, I'm going to ask just Jeff Hill to come up and help me. Brandon, would you get one and take close to the back? And we'll just have you kind of find your way to the